So this lecture is part of an online mathematics course on group theory, and it will be about normal subgroups of groups. Um, we will start by looking at groups of order six. So you remember we have found two examples of groups of order six. We found the group S3 of all symmetries of a triangle, and we found the group Z modulo 6z, the cyclic group of order 6, and we remember we saw this is actually isomorphic to z over 3z times z over 2z. And we'll start by looking at the um, um, subgroups of these groups. So for cyclic groups, it's really rather easy to work out the subgroups. The, the group is generated by some element g, and it's easy to check that all subgroups must be generated by some power of g, and this power may as well, you may as well take it to divide this number here. So z over 6z has exactly four subgroups. It's got the subgroup z over 6z itself, which is, say, generated by some element g. So it consists of, um, um, well, I, I guess we could just take g to be 1. So it consists of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And it's got a subgroup isomorphic to z over 2z, which is generated by 0 and spanned by 1 and 0 and 3. And it's got a subgroup um, z modulo 3z generated consisting of the elements 0, 2 and 4. And finally, <coughs> it's got a subgroup, the trivial group, just consisting of the element 0. Now for the group S3, it's almost as easy to find the subgroups. First of all, we've got the group S3 itself. And you remember this has six elements, which are the identity. Then we can switch one, two, or two, three, or three, one, or we can rotate one, two, three, or one, three, two. That's where we're labeling the elements of the triangle as one, two, three. Now, the order of any subgroup must divide the order of S3, which is six, so all subgroups of order two or three or one, which makes them really easy to work out. So we've got a subgroup of order three consisting of one, one, three, two, and one, two, three. And we've got three subgroups of order two, so we've one, one, two, one, one, three, and one, two, three. And we have the trivial group. So altogether, it has exactly one, two, three, four, five, six subgroups. And nothing terribly exciting is happening because um, there are no, <clears throat> there are as yet no inclusions between subgroups other than the trivial subgroup and the whole group. But we'll see some more complicated examples later. And um, what I want to discuss is the following problem. Suppose that H is a subgroup of G. Can we form a group G over H, a sort of quotient group? And the idea of the quotient group is you sort of force all elements of H to be trivial. Um, <clears throat> So we've seen some examples of this in number theory. If you take the group Z and you force all multiples of N to be trivial, then you get a sort of quotient group of the integers mod N, which is a group of order N. So this is a quotient of Z by a subgroup NZ. And how can we do this in general? Well, um, we should, um, we, we, we should, get an exact sequence, one goes to h, goes to g, goes to g over h, goes to one. So this means g should have a homomorphism onto this quotient group and the kernel should be exactly h. Well, you can see from this that the only serious possibility we can do is to take the elements of g over h to be the set of left cosets of H. So G acts on this quotient group by 
um, multiplication. And we saw that any set that G acts transitively on is the set of cosets of something. So, so G over H has to be the set of left cosets of H if it's anything at all. So the question is, can we make this into a group? So is this a group? And I mean, is it a group in a natural way? I mean, you can obviously define some sort of stupid group structure on it, but we want a sensible group structure on this. So, so let's look at two cosets. We've got a coset G1H and a coset G2H. And what is their product going to be? So let's multiply these cosets together. And the only thing we could possibly set it equal to is G1G2H. So I'll put a question mark there because we haven't yet there's a slight problem here. Is this well defined? So the problem is um, the coset G1 of H might also be a coset G3 of H for some other G3. So if we change G1 to G3 without changing this coset, then do we change this coset here? And that's a tricky problem. So, so let's have a look. Um, so if, if we put G3 equals G1H, then um, G3, G2H should be equal to G1, G2H, because um, G3H is the same coset as G1H, so, so the product with G2H should be the same. So, so is that true? Well, for that, we want G1H, G2H, equals g1 g2h just remind you that um, an expression like this means this the set of elements that are of the form g2 times something in h so is this true well um this is equal to g1 g2 times g2h G2 to the minus 1 H G2 times H. So we want this to be G1 G2 times something in H. And you can see that will hold provided this is in H. So we've got the following question. Is this element here in H? And if it's always in H, then we've got a well-defined multiplication on cosets. And, and it's very easy to check that, that if this multiplication is well-defined, then it's associative and has an identity and inverse, so it forms a group. So, so the big question is, is does this hold? And um, um, in fact, you can see the following conditions are equivalent. Um, first of all, uh, H is the kernel of some map from G to any group X. Secondly, um, G, H, G to the minus 1 equals H for all G in G. It doesn't really matter whether we have this as g and this is g to the minus one or this is g to the minus one or this is g so this just means all elements you can get by taking h all elements of h multiplying on the left by g and on the right by g inverse thirdly um well if g h g to the minus one equals h that's the same as saying g times h equals h times g for all g in g and this is the same as saying left cosets are the same as right cosets. And um, this, these are also the same as saying that a quotient group G over H exists defined by the construction above. So it's very easy to check that all these conditions are the same. I'll just leave this as a sort of exercise for people to do. Um, I've done a couple of cases of it, and the others are easy. And if H satisfies any of these five equivalent conditions, we say that H is a normal subgroup. Um, this being a good example um, 
this small subgroup subgroup of mathematicians using very unimaginative terminology. The word normal in mathematics is grossly overused as an adjective. Um, and this is one of the dozen or so places in which it's used. So the obvious question is, which subgroups are normal? Well, obviously, if G is abelian, then it's trivial to check that all subgroups normal because we can if it's a billion we can just sort of switch g to the other side of h and the first example of a non-abelian group we've had so far is the group s3 of order six so so if we're going to be looking for some examples of normal non-normal subgroups this is the obvious place to look so um Let's look at which subgroups of S3 are normal. Well, first of all, 1 and the whole of S3 are obviously normal. And the same is true for any group. The trivial group and the whole group are trivially normal subgroups. What about the group 1, 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2? Well, this group is index two. So you remember the index of a subgroup is the number of cosets. Well, did I mean left cosets or right cosets? Well, it turns out it doesn't really matter because the number of left cosets is the same as the number of right cosets. And to see this, we note that we have a map from uh, left cosets um, if we've got a left coset g h then this goes to a right coset just by taking the inverse of every element here so we take g h to the minus one by which i mean the inverses of all elements in this set and this is just h to the minus one g to the minus one which is h g to the minus one. You should remember that when you take inverses, you have to swap the order. So a, b to the minus one is b to the minus one, a to the minus one. So there's a natural one-to-one -one map between left cosets and right cosets, just by taking the inverse of every element of the coset. So the number of left cosets is the same as the number of right cosets, and it's just called the index. So this is one of the few cases when we don't need to worry about whether, whether we're talking about left or right cosets. So anyway, you've got this subgroup of index two and all subgroups of index two are normal. And this is easy to see because the only cosets, so if the subgroup is H, are H and things not in H because it has index two, one left coset is H, the other left coset must be everything not in H. And um, that's exactly the same as the right coset. So left cosets are the same as right cosets. So any subgroup of index two must be normal, in particular this one. Of course, we could just check directly, but it will let, later it will be useful to know that subgroups of index two are always normal. So um, let's look at the subgroups of index three or order two. Uh, well, let's look at the subgroup generated by containing elements one and one, two. So this is order two, index three. And this is not normal. So um, let's check this explicitly. Um, Let's find its left cosets and find its right cosets. So we've got one, one, two, three, one, three, two. And I'm going to write out the elements here as one, one, two, um, one, three, two, three. So here are the six elements of, of the group S3. And let's um, find the left cosets. 
um, of one and one and two. Well, there's one obvious left coset, which is these two elements here, because the, the subgroup itself is a left coset of itself. So for the next left coset, we want to work out what is the left coset of, of this. So we have to look at the elements one, two, three times one or one, two. And one, two, three times one is obviously just one, two, three. And one, two, three times one, two, well, it, it takes one, um, one, two, three times one, two. Um, well, uh, if it acts on the element one, this element takes one to two, and this element takes two to three. So this takes one to three. And if we apply this element to two, it takes two to one, and then this one takes one to two, so two goes to two, and obviously three goes to one. So this element is equal to one, three. So we get a coset here. And it's pretty obvious what the third coset is going to be. It's going to be this. So here are the three um, left cosets of one, two. Now let's work out the right cosets. Um, so the right cosets I will do in blue. So there's one obvious right coset, which is this. And then we've got to work out the right coset of one, two, three. And the right coset is going to be one, two, three, one, which is one, two, three, and one, two, three, um, um, one, two. And now again, we have to work at what this does. So, so this element takes, if we apply this to three, this takes three to one, and then this takes one to two. So three goes to two. If we apply this to two, this takes two to three, and that's fixed. So two and three are swapped, and it must take one to itself. So this is equal to two, three. So the right coset contains these two elements, and the remaining right coset must be the two things the left over. So, so we can see the three left cosets of these red things and the three right cosets of these blue things. And the subgroup is not normal because the left cosets are not the same as right cosets. And there's no really honest way of making the um, the, the set of three left cosets into a group. I mean, obviously you can make it into a group because it's a set with three elements and there are groups of three elements, but there's, I mean, th th there are stupid ways to make it into a group, but there are no nice ways to make it into a group. Well, that's one group. Um, what about the other groups? Well, we don't really need to do the other ones because um, um, if, H is a subgroup, so is G, H, G to the minus one. Um, and we can easily check this. We can just check it's closed. So if we've got some element G, A, G to the minus one, and we multiply it by G, B, G to the minus one, this is just equal to G, A, B, G to the minus one. So it's closed under multiplication. Um, this is called the conjugate of H by, um, by G. Um, and if you think about it a bit, you will see that this is really an action of group G on the set of subgroups. So G acts on the set of subgroups um, H. Um, the action is given by G of H. This is the I'm defining an action, and this is defined to be g h g to the minus one. So this is the definition of the action of g on h. So let's work out what this action looks like for the subgroups of the group S3. So, so there are, you remember, there were six groups. There was S3. There was the group generated by one, two. Um, these pointy brackets around an element or a set of elements often mean the group generated by those elements. In other words, the smallest subgroup contained by them. So we've got one, three, and two, three. And we've got this element, one, one, two, three, one, three, two. 
and let's work out what the conjugates are. Well, first of all, um, if a subgroup is normal, then the group acts trivial on it. So it just maps S3 to itself and it maps this group to itself and it maps um, one to itself. Um, however, um, if we take the subgroup one, two and act on it by one, three, so we take one, three, sorry, one, two, one, three, one, three, minus one you can calculate that this is actually the element two three so if we conjugate this subgroup by the element one three we get the subgroup two three and similarly if we conjugate two three by by um one two we get one three and so on so all these three elements form an orbit under the action of g on the group so the orbits kind of look like this so these three subgroups are all conjugate. Where conjugate means you can get from one to the other by this action. And conjugation of the group G is a sort of, is actually a symmetry of G. We notice that G A B G to minus one is G A G to minus one G B G to minus one. So in other words, conjugation by g is actually a symmetry of the group and anything you can say about something is, is sort of still true if if, if, if if you're conjugate by it um, in particular if if this group is not normal then its conjugate is also not normal and this conjugate is not normal so these three groups are all not normal once we've checked one conjugate is not normal we don't need to bother with the others since they're all um, equivalent under a symmetry of the group um, and you can see that under this action of g on the set of groups the normal subgroups are just the subgroups that are fixed by g meaning that every element of g maps that group to itself so so here we have g acting on a set of six elements it fixes these three elements, which are the normal subgroups, and it acts transitively on this set of three elements, which are therefore non-normal subgroups. Um, so um, if G has a subgroup H, then G is sort of composed. Um, so suppose G has a normal subgroup H. So if G is a normal subgroup H, then we have this exact sequence. One goes to H, goes to G, goes to G over H. And if H is not one or G, then these groups will be smaller than G. So these are usually smaller than G. So the idea is we can sort of break G up into, into groups that we hope are smaller and therefore easier to understand and um, if we're lucky we can reduce properties of g to properties of these two groups um, i'll just emphasize yet again that if we know h and if we know the normal subgroup h and the quotient group g over h this does not determine g just a reminder from last lecture that we've got these sequences naught goes to z over 2z goes to z over 4z goes to z over 2, z goes to 1, so it's naught, and naught goes to z over 2, z goes to z over 2, z times z over 2, z goes to z over 2, z goes to naught. So, so we have two different groups. They both have the same or an isomorphic subgroup z over 2, z, and the quotients are isomorphic, uh, but that doesn't imply these two groups are isomorphic. So there's a complicated problem of trying to work out what possibilities there are for G, provided you know these two groups here. We'll be giving an example of that um, in a two or three lectures time when we discuss groups of order eight. Um, well, we haven't, what we haven't yet done is classify the groups of order six. Mm. So we will do that next lecture.